Hey everyone, and welcome back to Scandalous Media. It's Angela here, and we have to talk about the show that is Omitsukobi's new book, Endgame, and just how far Meghan Markle and Prince Harry will go to A, be somehow relevant, and B, take out their long vendetta against the royal family. Nothing like attacking your sister-in-law and the literal king of England. And you'd think they are doing it on some serious basis, considering the accusations made against the Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, as well as King Charles are quite extreme, but nope, it's just regular old Meghan and Harry. Oh, but it's Omid Scobie talking, not them. Okay, and what is the role of Omid Scobie? Right, being the Sussex mouthpiece. But nothing is funnier than how everything already backfired into Omid's face, Harry's face, and Meghan's face. I'm going to take you through points set in Endgame, expose everyone's lies, talk about the so-called royal racists named, and so much more. Before we start, be sure to like and subscribe for more content each week, follow us on our social media, we post weekly TikToks and Reels about all current celeb drama including Meghan and Harry, check out our blog for Inside Celebrity Tea, and without further ado, let's get to the bottom of this drama. Their brand, gossiping about the royal family. As you guys know, I have been covering Harry and Meghan's shenanigans for a couple of years now, and I've been keeping up with everything the royal family has done, and it's safe to say that Harry and Meghan's brand solely revolves around making themselves a victim of the royal family and trying to come up with the most scandalous story about them for relevancy. I'll give you guys a few seconds to think of anything Harry and Meghan did that didn't revolve around on the royal family. And anything they did do that isn't gossiping about how William was too formal or too bold or how Catherine didn't want to share her lip gloss with this weird woman right here, it didn't make any noise. Harry's mental health documentary with Oprah? <coughs> Megan visiting schools to talk over Harry and talk all about herself? <coughs> Megan's 40x40 B-Day campaign? <coughs> you know it's bad when everything they do that is of significance is always brought back to the royal family, such as the slanderous Oprah interview filled with lies, Harry's Mon Moir spare, and of course the Netflix soap opera. Not to mention faking a New York car chase and getting dropped by Spotify for scamming them out of millions. And yet, after all of this is happening, and after they can't make a name for themselves, they will sit there and have the sheer audacity to claim that the royal family was too jealous of them and their power and their popularity. When someone who's marrying in, who should be a supporting, a supporting act, is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this. Every single member of the family, senior members of the family had been, including the Queen, and on the front page of the Telegraph, Meghan. I went, oh my God. She was like, but it's not my fault. And I said, I know. And my mom felt the same way. <laughs> well, where is this popularity and power now? And where does this bring us? Oh yeah, right at the beginning of the story. Early 2021, when Meghan and Harry tried to accuse the royal family of racism. Hold up, there's Stop several right now. There are several conversations There's a about conversation it. with you? With Harry. About how dark your baby is going to be? potentially and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. They tried to ride that story as much as they could until they were suffocated with their own lies. What did they do then? All right, Harry went on to say that Meghan never accused them of racism and it was, um, all right, unconscious bias. In the Oprah interview, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even, really? well, of the British press said that. Right. All had to deal with things that are rude. Rude and racist are not the same. I, did, did Meghan ever mention that they were racist? Concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. Right. Wouldn't you describe that as essentially racist? I wouldn't, not having lived within that family. Rude and racist are not the same. Dutch version of Endgame calls out Princess Catherine and King Charles. As I'm sure you guys know by now, in the Dutch version of Omid's book, Endgame, Omid writes about what Harry and Meghan said on Oprah, which is that they were asked about the color of Archie's skin and even went as far as saying that there were concerns about how dark Archie was going to be. Rude and racist are not the same. The Dutch version names the alleged royal racists as King Charles and Princess Catherine. I made a short video about that to solely discuss that point alone, but as promised, I will be dragging and exposing everyone in this video. After the names appeared in the Dutch version of the book, the books have been taken off the shelves. Now understand that this is 100% done intentionally and let me explain why. 
I wholeheartedly believe that Harry and Meghan are behind the revolting claims made in Endgame because just like they used everyone on Netflix to say what they didn't want to say themselves, Omid is no different. Matter of fact, they have been exposed to use him before considering they helped with the writing and information of Finding Freedom, a book that was perfectly curated to make Meghan seem like this shining light of fresh air in an outdated monarchy that wanted nothing to do with her. It was another victim narrative we had to sit through where even then, the lies she fed Omid and the other co-author, Carolyn Duran, she couldn't even keep up with. Whether it was giving the wrong details about her and Harry's first date in the book versus what she said on Netflix, or claiming on Oprah that no one helped her with royal training, meanwhile a different story is painted in Finding Freedom, it all shows us how much Meghan is involved and how much of a liar she is. She lied in court and said that she had nothing to do with the book only to apologize to the court and claim that she forgot her role in the book. Who the hell would believe that? Not to mention Harry being exposed in emails with Jason Knopf where he literally says that both he and Meghan have to say that they have nothing to do with finding freedom while stating what he wants discussed in the book to clear up their names. This is literally straight from Harry's mouth saying, yeah, we have to make sure that nobody knew we had something to do with this book. So sorry, Omid, your credibility is down the toilet. The fact that he thought he could write another book and claim that Meghan and Harry had nothing to do with it is laughable. Wow, you really are stupid, huh? Also, I have an update on Prince Harry's court case where Omid Scobie's relationship to them is also mentioned, so I will be talking about that later in the video. But in all honesty, who in their right mind would believe they had nothing to do with the book when Omid says word for word what Harry and Meghan say, not to mention their track record? Even the book makes it very clear that we're talking about unconscious bias here. It comes to unconscious bias, but once you realize or you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Omid's ITV interview where he throws everyone under the bus. Omid spent the entirety of his embarrassing ITV interview still pretending that he doesn't have any sort of connection to Harry and Meghan. You know, a lot of the speculation is that you are a mouthpiece for Harry and yeah. Meghan. So what is your relationship with Harry and Meghan? I'm not their friend. I've never sat down with Meghan privately for interviews. I've never uh, exchanged information with Meghan. I'm not in their private world in any way whatsoever. Liar! Nobody said that you have tea at their house every single day, but clearly he's part of the Sussex agenda where they use him to exploit everyone in the royal family while simultaneously crying about media exploitation. And just like Meghan threw Alison P. Davis, the black journalist for the Cut interview, under the bus, Omid threw the translators and anyone responsible for the publication of the book under the bus as well. Speaking to ITV, he said, It's still being investigated right now. What do you think happened? I wrote and edited the English version of the book with one publisher. That, co that then gets man uh, licensed to other publishers. I obviously can't speak Italian, German, no. French, Dutch, or any of the other languages that come out. So the only time you hear about the book is once it's come out in the public domain. <laughs> it's just a bunch of word salad like his bestie, Megan. What do you mean you wrote the English version and then magically the Dutch version included the names Catherine and Charles? Do Catherine and Charles' names actually translate to tea and biscuits? Because with the way Omid is making it seem, he's acting like the Dutch translators pulled it out of their <laughs> But like every liar, the truth gets exposed and the liar ends up backtracking. Lies and backtracking. So we have Omid on candid camera saying that he has no idea how the names got there, right? Because he wrote the English version only. Well, sources tell the Times that Omid's agent sent the draft manuscript to the Dutch publisher naming the king and the princess of Wales. So if the sources are correct, Omid Scobie did intend to include the names in the book and I assume Harry and Meghan knew it and possibly even orchestrated it. Because the names can't appear out of thin air and placing blame on the Dutch translators seems intentional and all part of the plan. Omid even goes as far as saying, well, a bunch of journalists knew the names over the years. Journalists across Fleet Street know, have known those names for a long time. We've all followed a certain code of conduct when it comes to talking about it. Insinuating that the Dutch translators chose to write in the names. At the time, the Times was investigating this and they wrote that Omid Scobie's agent sent the final version of the book to the Dutch publisher, which did not name the two royals. However, United Talent Agency had earlier sent a draft to the Dutch publisher, which did contain the names. I know. Now they're blaming the Dutch translator because they interpreted the earlier version and not the approved one. One of the Dutch translators, Saska Peters, said that the names were in the manuscript that she was sent. 
She said, I translate what is in front of me. I did not add them. This reminds me of when Megan tried to attack the interviewer who did the engagement interview and Michelle Hussein was just like, I was asked to do said interview and I did said interview because Megan was going on about how this whole thing was an orchestrated reality TV show. After all this backlash, Omid backtracked and confirmed what the Times said, which is that he wrote the names in the original version of the book, which he not only wrote, but sent to the translators. And now they're crying about the translators doing their job, which is translating. It's like, what do you think would happen, Omid? Did you think the translators were going to wait around for your third and fourth versions? It's insanity. And as Harry loses his court case, Omid gets exposed some more, as another judge draws a direct line between Omid and the Markles, saying, Omid Scobie, a journalist known to be supportive of the Sussexes, also appeared to have been briefed by Harry's team. At this point, people will believe him more if he does say that he represents Harry and Meghan instead of playing this little game of like, no, how did you think that? One Twitter user wrote, didn't he swear in his parents' life that he never wrote the names and now he says he wrote names but that version should not have gone out? To which Omid replied back saying, please don't put out such a disgusting thing. I swore that it was not a publicity stunt. What's so disgusting? The person mentioning the fact that he did swear in his parents' life, claiming that he had no idea how this all happened and how it's not a publicity stunt? And yet we have him here on camera saying that he swears on his life and his family's life. Can you, hand on heart, look me in the eye and say it wasn't a publicity stunt? On my, on my life, on my family's life. I, I don't need yeah. to go that far. I know, of course, but, no, but it's serious. Not to mention that he did come clean about writing the names. This perfectly curated plan seems like Megan's doing. She lets everyone know the story on Oprah and then holds off on the names. And you're not going to tell me who had the conversation? I think that would be very damaging to them. Okay. <laughs> I'm never going to share. Just like she had her friend speak to People magazine about a letter she wrote her father, one that no one knew existed until that interview, forcing Thomas's hand to expose the letter to defend himself from her claims in People magazine. And then she pretends like, oh my god, how did the letter get out there? This is the same story. No one knew the story took place, let alone the names of those who allegedly questioned Archie's skin color. And as we know, Queen Elizabeth said, recollections may vary, and we only know the story because of Meghan. And a lot of people have come out, especially mixed couples, talking about how a baby will look like from a mixed couple is common practice and something that's often done like lovingly. Like, oh, do you think he's gonna resemble the father more? Or do you think he's gonna resemble the mother more? And the fact that Megan went out of her way to curate this whole story as a racist attack because she did say that there were concerns, right? Concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. If there's concerns about something, that means it's not good. If there's concerns about skin color, that means you're racist. If you don't want someone to look a certain way. You, you accuse members of your family of racism. You don't even, really? well. So they're backtracking on the racist story because they know it doesn't make any sense. Because who in their right mind is looking at this white passing woman when she puts down the bronzer and this white man right here and thinking, oh gee, I'm really scared that the baby may turn out to be a little dark. Regardless of how Archie would have turned out, I think he would be perfectly fine in any way. I'm not the one with an issue. It's Megan who was on Netflix that looked like she was more happy that Lily resembled more of Harry and Princess Diana as opposed to this face that she made right here when Harry said that Archie resembled her. She's got the same blue eyes. Blue, blue, blue eyes. eyes. I see a lot of my wife in Archie. I see a lot of my mum and Lily. Honestly, the whole story sounds like a lot of Megan's projection, considering, you know, she's never been treated like a black woman. Most people didn't treat me like a black woman. So that talk didn't have to happen for me. And it sounds like more of her issue that she's trying to make with the royal family. Meghan Markle is now reportedly complaining that a black man was hired to help her during her days in the royal family, saying that she felt insulted. Of course, this is all according to her good friend Omid Scobie, who's writing books about how Meghan was a victim of the royal family, but all I'm seeing is a situation where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. 
According to Omid Scobie's book Endgame, the palace suggested that Queen Elizabeth's household cavalry officer, Lieutenant Colonel Nana Kofi Tuamsi Ankara, step in to help Meghan adjust to her new royal duties. Though a charming and intelligent man, it stood out like a sore thumb to Meghan and her friends, Scobie wrote. Meghan and her friends were insulted when the palace suggested that the Queen's attendant assist her. So many white people were hired to work for Meghan, namely Samantha Cohen and Jason Knopf. But a black man is where she draws the line? Seriously? Mind you, the lieutenant colonel was appointed by Queen Elizabeth II as her equerry and he was the first black man to hold this position. So this just confirms that Queen Elizabeth gave Meghan the best of the best, just like when Samantha Cohen was practically brought out of retirement for Meghan. Leave it to Meghan to get insulted that he was assigned to assist her, while also complaining that no one was hired to help her adjust with her new role. So which one is it? Speaking of Meghan, let's talk about her papstrolls. Meghan's papstrol. Meghan and Harry are always quick to address claims that expose them, but when they're behind the damaging claims for the royal family, it's crickets. After all this drama, Meghan of course organized a pap stroll where she was seen smiling and being all happy in an empty parking lot as usual. The thing about Meghan is that her pap strolls are intentional because she will always get photographed by Backgrid, the same people she tried to attack, in a random parking lot often reflecting the climate of whatever the news is talking about. When Harry was in Germany for the Invictus Games, she made sure to stage a photo shoot at a drive-thru. When Harry flew to the UK on the anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's death, she staged photos of her looking glum and driving her car for the first time in years, emulating the photos that we got of Catherine driving her car looking sad following the Queen's passing a year prior. When Spotify dropped them for literally scamming them out of millions, she made sure to stage a random pap stroll once again in a random parking lot, it seems, of her looking glum. And when the media and everyone started calling the royal family racist because of what Team Sussex is accusing Catherine and Charles of, she was seen out strong with a big smile on her face. It's funny because in this video, you can see a lady pass right by her, not even caring about her or even recognizing her or taking a second to look up. This is hilarious considering Harry and Meghan's security argument. Harry loses his court case. Speaking of which, Harry lost his legal challenge in a libel claim against Mail on Sunday. Harry's court case has been ridiculous due to how many lies and I don't knows he said in court, which I made a whole video about, so go check it out. But what's funny is how a judge ruled that a newspaper may successfully argue in court that his team undertook a masterclass of spinning to mislead the public about his offer to pay for security. Would you look at that? They basically got exposed again as grifters because they want money for no reason for security. His lawyers are once again stating behind closed doors the supposed incident at Wellchild where Harry claimed that he was chased by paparazzi while leaving the event, and yet here's what occurred when Harry's vehicle was leaving the premises. Nothing happened. Not one car chased him, not one person waited for him. The road is as empty as an event for Meghan and Harry. He cried again in court about security concerns for Meghan and their kids that no one sees, saying, I cannot put my wife in danger. Your wife can't be put in danger because no one cares about her, buddy. Anytime she's photographed, not even a waitress will do a double take. And just before he lost the court case, he told the court, It was with great sadness to both of us that my wife and I felt forced to step back from this role and leave the country in 2020. Whatever you say. This is how you know they're liars because in their official statement leaving the royal family, they wrote that they want to carve out a progressive role within the institution to work to become financially independent and balance their time between the UK, North America, honoring the Queen at the time, the Commonwealth, and patronages. You know what this means? They wanted half in, half out. They wanted access to use the royal status and titles to monetize whatever they could and do whatever they wanted while still getting funding from the royal family and choosing to opt out of the work they do but still getting invitations to lavish state banquets and more. Basically, they wanted the privileges without the work. This is why the Queen stopped a lot of their, mainly Meghan's, opportunities at trademarking certain things so they don't use the royal family name and the British people to sell cheap merch. It's hilarious how time proves all. Meghan's personal vendetta against Catherine. What Meghan doesn't realize is that all of us hear her through her mouthpieces. She can get Tyler Perry, Harry, Omid Scobie, all those people on Netflix and more to say whatever she wants, but we can hear her through them. We know who's feeding them what. In Endgame, Kate is painted as slightly pathetic, suffering from a crippling stage fright, a bag of nerves before a pre-taped television appearance, Omid wrote and basically treated as a pet that's coddled by the palace and press alike. 
What's funny is that there was a story a few years back saying that Megan didn't want to coddle anyone. So notice how the words are making an appearance. And Omid makes Catherine out to be a Machiavellian operator with a cold side who immediately took a dislike to the more confident, self-assured Megan. Ugh. Oh. Rather than the peace broker she's often painted as, in Endgame, Omid implies that Catherine was the architect of the Queen's some recollections may vary response to Meghan and Harry's Oprah interview claims. If that is true and Catherine was responsible for that iconic line, then I guess by default, Catherine is iconic. Omid describes Catherine as infinitely coachable and sometimes Stepford-like, having successfully sublimated her authentic self to fulfill her role as a vessel for a dynastic family and a token of glamour and youth. There is a sort of like very reserved, almost Stepford-like approach to the, it's kind of to me, the position. It's, a lot of it feels like a bit of a hatchet job against the royal family, okay? Uh, Catherine's also portrayed as a social climber who conspired with her mother to carry the family name further to the top and deliberately paraded in front of the paparazzi in order to get William's attention after they broke in 2007. Omid mentions a nickname some parts of the internet have for her, Katie Keen, which is what people use to drag her for being desperate. Kate was called Weighty Katie, waiting to marry William. Now he wrote all of this for Catherine, right? And in contrast, he wrote that Meghan's arrival was a bit of a rocket up the insert word here, who made the Cambridges look a little dull in comparison, forcing Catherine and her team to rework her image into someone similarly dynamic and effective. <laughs> all I hear is Meghan being jealous of Catherine and thinking she's better. First of all, Omid doesn't know Catherine, nor do the Cambridges work or inform him in any way possible. He's basically the same outcast as Harry and Meghan. But the way he is describing Catherine reminds me of petty schoolgirls talking badly about another girl who's succeeding. This book is basically a fan cam of Meghan and a hate blog of Catherine. Meghan couldn't be more obvious that she's butthurt that Catherine is well liked without going out of her way to be liked. If people like her for being polite, showing up to events, being well-dressed, and whatever else people like her for, that doesn't mean that she's this fake little child who was terrified of Meghan. It simply means that she's good at what she does despite the criticism she receives for lack of royal engagements. Sources for Meghan are now saying that Meghan felt that she had more of a right to speak than Catherine at certain events because she was a self-made woman. Hold your laughter. The source said, she seemed to feel like she had more of a right to speak than her sister-in-law, who had married into the family as an unknown, whereas Meghan regarded herself as a philanthropist who could teach the royals a thing or two about charity. Is that so? Nothing is funnier than the fact that Meghan had to marry up the social ladder to get herself some roles in Hollywood, and even that was not enough for me to even know who she was to write about her back before she married Harry. And the fact that she's rebranding that as a self-made woman, now that's hilarious. Girl, if you don't sit back and thank Trevor and Corey for introducing you to high-class society? Nobody tell Meghan that Catherine is now being regarded as the people's princess in America as ratings skyrocket for her and plummet for Meghan. And after all of that, Omid Scobie's book Endgame sold less than 6,500 copies in its first five days in Britain and sold only nine copies in its first week in America. It also plunged to 215 on Amazon's bestsellers chart. Megan and Harry are ridiculous and their lies keep suffocating them. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know if you want me to expose more of Omid Scobie's lies in Endgame in a different video. What do you think about everything I talked about here? Let me know in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos each week. Follow us on our social media. Turn on the notifications so you don't miss the live chat we do for every video. And as always, I'll see you next time.